This week, I'm going to show you seven rules of photography. Even though these are rules, you don't always have to stick to them and you can get some amazing shots when you break all of them. Think of them more as guidelines to help you learn photography. The legendary photojournalist Arthur Ouija Felig was first credited with using this term, F8 and be there. In the 1930s in New York, he was always the one to get there and get the shot for the newspapers. And this is so true. If you're not there, you're not gonna get the shot. The reason why it's F8 and be there is because at F8, the depth of focus is quite deep. So you're more than likely to get your subject in focus. And it's all about capturing the moment. So if you were to have a low f-stop and you were to point the camera at the subject, you might capture the moment, but they might not be in focus. At F8, the subject is more likely to be in focus. For instance, if you were doing street photography on a really sunny day, you had your settings at 1 400th of a second, at ISO 100 and F8, you could pretty much walk around taking photos of everything and anything that's going on around you. Then you'd more likely capture the moment and not have to worry about the settings. And with today's modern cameras, you can always pull back the shadows and the highlights. So this is really true in today's photography as it was in the 1930s. F8 and be there. This is a rule to follow when shooting handheld. Basically you take your focal length figure and then make sure your shutter speed figure doesn't drop below this. If your hands are relatively steady and you follow this rule, you should get a clear and crisp shot. For instance, if I'm shooting with a 25 mm lens, I won't let my shutter speed drop below 1 25th of a second. If I'm shooting with an 85 mm, the slowest shutter speed I'll use is around 1 85th of a second. If I'm shooting with a 200 mm lens, I'll make sure my shutter speed is 1 200th of a second or faster. Now this is the most well-known rule in photography. It's where you break your image up into three sectors on the vertical plane and then on the horizontal plane. So you end up with a grid like this. Then if you place your subject on one of these lines or where they intersect, most of the time it'll give a pleasing image. Also, if you're shooting a landscape, if you put the horizon on one of the horizontal planes, that'll also make the image a little bit more compelling. This is not always true, but if you generally stick to this rule, your photos will start to look a lot better. Now this differs from the rule of thirds, and it's more about the subject or subjects that you're shooting. When shooting multiple objects, this is a rule to think about. When shooting groups of the same thing, try and get three of them in the shot. It seems to make the photograph work a lot better. Sometimes they can be in different positions or lined up, but three of an object seems to work really well in a photograph. This is really interesting and it refers to the logarithmic scale that photographic settings follow. So with shutter speed, if you start at 1 100th of a second and half the amount of light, you'll go to 1 200th of a second. If you halve it again, you go to 1 400th of a second. If you halve it again, you go to 1 800th of a second and then 1 1600th of a second and so on and so forth. With ISO, if you start at 100 and double the light, you'll go to ISO 200. If you double the light again, you'll go to 400. And then again, 800, and then 1600. So you can see, even though they're going in opposite directions, they follow the same pattern. So if you're shooting at 1 800th of a second at ISO 800, if you wanted the same exposure with a lower shutter speed, you can drop it down to say 1 400th of a second, and all you'd have to do is drop your ISO down to 400. If you wanted to drop the shutter speed down to 1 100th of a second, all you do is drop it down to ISO 100. In practical terms, if you are shooting with a 400 mm lens, handheld, with a shutter speed of 1 100th of a second at ISO 100, if you wanted to raise the shutter speed so you didn't get handheld blur, what you'd do is raise it up to 1 400th of a second at ISO 400. This would give you exactly the same exposure. Obviously, in a real life situation, you drop your f-stop down first, but I'm just showing you the relationship with ISO and shutter speed. And this relationship leads us up to the last rule. 
A long time ago, when I used to shoot with film, I would use the Sunny 16 rule. And it's basically a way of looking at the conditions and getting some settings that you can start with, especially if you forgot your light meter. So it goes like this. If you set your ISO and shutter speed at the same number, let's say 1 100th of a second and ISO 100, if it's a sunny, bright day, you set your aperture to f16 and you'll get good exposure. When shooting on film, you'd never get that instant feedback. So this was really important. Nowadays, because the cameras give you instant feedback, you can just use this rule as a starting point. And if you learn this rule, it'll teach you a lot about the settings of the camera and how they interact with each other. If you search online for the Sunny 16 rule, you'll find lots of cheat sheets and charts. This will give you an idea of what settings to shoot when. If you keep your ISO and shutter speed figure the same, then you can follow these rules. F16 on a sunny day, F11 on a partially cloudy day, F8 on a cloudy day, F5.6 on a dark and stormy day, F4 around about sunset. It may seem complicated, but if you keep the shutter speed and ISO figure exactly the same and just take along or memorize the cheat sheet, you'll have a really good starting point. Also, if you want to learn as much about photography as possible, it's worth learning this rule. Then you can literally go to a location, look to see what the conditions are and know exactly what settings to shoot in. As you learn more about photography, you can then decide what settings you want and you'll pretty much know what to shoot. And then it's just a case of dialing in those settings. With practice, you'll be able to go to a location and pretty much get the settings right first time. You might have to click a third of a stop one way or another, but most of the time you can get it right. It's a fun challenge to do, and if you want to impress your photo buddies, then this is a really good one to learn. What you'll find is if you're just getting into photography and you don't know about these rules, you might take the odd shot that looks amazing. You don't know why, but you know it's a good shot. Normally it's because it's breaking these rules or following them in a certain way. But once you learn them, you'll understand why the photograph looks good. Then by consciously following or breaking these rules, you'll be able to create some really compelling shots. And that's my aim with this channel. I wanna help you become the best photographer you can possibly be. As always, if you like what you see, give me a thumbs up. If you didn't, give me a thumbs down. And for weekly tutorials, hints and tips in photography and videography, subscribe and turn on notifications. I'll see you next time.